Hello, everyone. I'm Liz Wishnick from the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University and Montclair State University. It's our great pleasure to welcome back uh, Dr. Luke Haiti, a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies and lead senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies at the University of Oxford in the UK. He is the author of the new book, how China Loses, The Pushback Against China's Global Ambitions, published uh, just recently by Oxford University Press. This is the book right here. Um, his work focuses on the intersection of China's trade, investment, and finance with its foreign and security policy. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Hindu Foreign Affairs and Foreign Policy. He holds a doctorate and a master's of science from the Copenhagen Business School and a bachelor's degree from Queen's University. Uh, Patey's last book was, Dr. Patey's last book was The New Kings of Crude, China, India, and the Global Struggle for Oil in Sudan and South Sudan. And we were lucky to have Dr. Patey talk to us about that book, and we're so pleased he could return to talk about his latest work. Dr. Petty um, uh, will speak for about 35, uh, 40 minutes or so, and then we will open up uh, for questions, in, and you can write your questions in the Q&A field. So Dr. Petty. Thanks so much. Um... Thanks for having me, Professor Wishnick, and, and, and thanks to the Weatherhead East Asian uh, Institute and the other sponsors at Columbia for, for hosting this event. It's great to be back. Um, so what I want to do today is basically over the next 35 minutes or so, um, talk about the motivation I had for, for writing this book um, and the basically go over sort of three three characters briefly um, that that appear in the book and some of the questions I think they they provoke us uh, to rethink about uh, China's global influence and then finally uh, discuss where I think uh, things are headed uh, with China's relations with the world moving forward so the book um, really came out of uh, both uh, a fascination with witnessing China's expanding global presence around the world uh, where I traveled um, from Africa to East Asia, but at the same time, uh, a frustration um, with seeing images uh, like these um, that, that, that came out in, in a lot of uh, newspapers and, and magazines um, uh, when I when I returned home or when I was traveling, the, the, these images really um, convey the idea that China's rise and, and China's presence in the world seems to be connected with its competition with, with the United States. Um, and that, you know, when I, from the vantage point I had in, in visiting uh, places in East Africa or Latin America, um, my contention really was that there was a lot more going on, that China's relations with the rest of the world would also be quite significant in shaping the extent of its global power and influence. And what I try to do in the book is place China's relations with the rest of the world in the spotlight. And what I found was that there's actually a diversity of power in the world today, um, and that China is facing new risks and challenges towards its global influence. And rather than this US-China rivalry, uh, China's relations with developing countries in, in Africa and Latin America, but also advanced economies in Europe and Asia will determine its ultimate global influence. So the book is not, um, it does not argue that China is not a significant power. Um, it does not argue that China is not uh, a superpower. China is clearly already an economic superpower. It also has vaulting military strength. 
It has newfound influence um, around the world. But I don't think we're headed to a future where China will have a commanding dominant influence on global affairs and the global economy. And this outcome doesn't mean that the US um, will, the US dominance will be restored. Um, I argue that rather that the current direction that China's leadership uh, has chosen to project China's power often fails to overcome some of the inherent challenges it faces in the world and even elicits pushback from other major powers that can undermine its future rise and its future potential. So there's no better place to, to start to explore um, the extent of China's global influence than investigating its global project, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, many of you might know the Belt and Road Initiative is President Xi Jinping's project of the century, his foreign policy signature. And it aspires to do many things, but one of its main thrusts is to finance and build transport, communication, and energy infrastructure. Uh, but it also wants to connect new industrial corridors between China and the outside world, develop manufacturing links, expand uh, the reach of Chinese companies and its technology standards, and also foster political and cultural cooperation. And it extends across the Euro-Asian landmass and also along the Pacific and uh, Indian uh, littoral ocean, oceans and beyond, uh, even into Latin America. Now in the US and in Europe and even in India, the, the, the debate on the Belt and Road is often uh, phrased around this question of whether it's a debt trap uh, or it's just business. Um, the debt trap being that some argue that China is intentionally ensnaring partner countries in heavy levels of debt that will allow them to gain control of strategic assets, such as ports, uh, when these countries can, cannot pay their loans back to Chinese policy banks. The just business argument uh, puts forward the idea that China really doesn't have all too many uh, geopolitical or strategic goals behind the Belt and Road, that it's just a commercial endeavor um, and that uh, there, there's no intention to, to trap countries uh, in, in, in high levels of debt. And, you know, the Belt and Road uh, has a lot of goals behind it uh, that we often don't discuss. Uh, it, 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 Xi Jinping has, has said quite clearly that he wants uh, China to, to help its partner countries develop. Uh, he, he says that this is a new option, that China offers a new option for countries to speed up their development while preserving their independence. And this is, this is really the question um, that we need to be focused on is the development success of the Belt and Road. Uh, that I think will in ultimately uh, determine China's uh, inf the influence that China gains through the initiative. And this is really the question that uh, an East African diplomat um, I met in Beijing uh, has on his mind um, involving the Belt and Road and, and engaging China. Now, when I met the diplomat, we were driving in, Be uh, we were driving in Beijing last and passing buildings, uh, futuristic buildings, modern buildings, and discussing, discussing subjects that foreigners often do in China's megacities, this fast-paced development, uh, the fast-paced life of, of China's uh, populous cities, and the fast-paced development uh, and, and, and ra the raising of life, life uh, standards across the country over the past couple of decades. And the East African diplomat hoped that his country could take on um, and, and experience the same type of dramatic growth that China had. Uh, and you know, this is something that Xi Jinping has often presented to the de developing countries as well. And at the 2018 Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, she called on African countries to step on the express train to China's development. So Xi Jinping knows the power of example that China provides uh, through its fast-paced development over the last couple of decades. 
there are also economic goals, um, and those are to really to offshore a lot of China's uh, uh, heavy industries that were built up uh, post the post the post global financial crisis uh, when China offered a large stimulus uh, to its industries. And now these industries need to sort of offshore this overcapacity in, in, in construction and in cement uh, and in, in railways, uh, in a lot of different heavy industries abroad. And, and this is something that countries in the developing world in particular need. They need new infrastructure. Africa, for example, has a $100 billion infrastructure gap, uh, annual infrastructure gap. Uh, Asia has a $1.7 trillion annual infrastructure gap. So the, this is something that the world really much needs as well. Um, so China's hoping that by expanding, by bringing some of this overcapacity abroad, it will ease its own uh, economic pressures uh, and expand the reach of its companies and technology at the same time. So how is the Belt and Road succeeding? Uh, is it bringing development success abroad? Is it fulfilling the political and economic goals that China has behind it? So in the, in the book, uh, I argue that China uh, faces quite a number of challenge, challenges in, in bringing uh, the Belt and Road uh, to countries to, 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 to ignite development success. Um, this starts at the initiation of projects. Um, the projects, you know, they don't come with political strings as, as you know, we often hear, but they come with quite a few economic strings. And those economic strings include that many of the loans China offers for infrastructure projects are heavily tied and conditioned to the use of Chinese contractors and Chinese products in the development of new infrastructure. So 89% uh, of contractors are Chinese, uh, as one study found, uh, whereas only 8% are local. Uh, and this you know, diverges from typical uh, practice in, in development finance, such as you know, that, that advanced by the World Bank. And this really has an immediate effect of crowding out uh, local construction and, and, and local industries from getting involved in the development of these projects. Secondly, uh, the infrastructure alone uh, won't generate economic productive activity. We often think that uh, you know, any road or any railway will do when countries lack infrastructure, but they need to be linked to new economic productive activities. They need to help uh, partner countries uh, get their exports uh, to international markets or to regional markets or even to domestic markets. They need to drive new jobs and growth. Infrastructure alone uh, doesn't have uh, you know, an, a, a long-term uh, productivity if it doesn't link up with, with domestic industries and domestic companies. China itself, um, you know, has a has a has, has a, a, a infrastructure history uh, in developing its own infrastructure that doesn't necessarily produce a lot of economic productive activity. As one uh, University of Oxford study found, only one third of of infrastructure projects it focused on in China produced economic productive activity. Thirdly, there's there's been sort of a promise made um, by by some scholars uh, that, that Chinese um, manufacturing would offshore along with the Belt and Road. And that because costs in China are rising, that, that, that man, low, low cost manufacturing or low valued goods, clothes and apparel um, would offshore from China and Chinese investment would flood into Africa uh, and other regions of the, of, of the world to drive new development. But again, studies show that this really isn't uh, happening at such a grand uh, pace. Uh, only 10% of the companies surveyed by, by Peking University researchers um, indicated that they were actually going abroad. Many Chinese companies are actually staying at home or moving within China to lower their costs and often uh, going forward with automation rather than going abroad. And when Chinese manufacturing companies have been going abroad, they've typically went to Southeast Asia, uh, which has a, a competitive, uh, more competitive uh, infrastructure and still has low cost labor. Uh, and they're not very much going to Africa. You'll often hear uh, and see images uh, of uh, Chinese uh, 
run um, special economic zones uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, and Ethiopia has, has demonstrated some successes with, with gathering Chinese and other international manufacturing investment. But this is really uh, the one spotlight case. And Ethiopia, for example, is, is not Africa. Um, the, the broader diversity um, of, the, of the continent is not represented just simply by Ethiopia's own success. So we see more of a looming challenge for, for African countries in particular, um, but also elsewhere to attract a lot of this manufacturing investment that many thought would leave China. Finally, on the Belt and Road, uh, in some markets, in, in sort of middle income countries uh, like Argentina, uh, like Malaysia, there are competing local industries and they push back um, to, to, to capture some of this finance um, from the Chinese. And this has the effect of, of lowering the level that China can offshore some of its heavy industries. So it's, it's, a, it's a very sort of um, uh, difficult position that China's in, that if it wants to succeed uh, and bring development success to, to other countries, it will need to sort of give more of the economic benefits of its loans to, to local industries. Um, but if it does that, it will be harder for it to achieve some of its economic aims behind the Belt and Road Initiative. And we, we've we seen uh, over the years that the finance offered, at least for infrastructure uh, in, in Africa, Latin America, and globally has fallen um, quite dramatically. Uh, and that perhaps the Belt and Road, its first act was one of, of infrastructure and a focus on infrastructure. And that seems to be uh, coming to an end, uh, or at least dampening in, it, in its extent. Um, of course, the Belt and Road is not uh, uh, out. Um, we see you know, a new digital and health focus behind it, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this might give it new life. Uh, so it's if for countries that um, want to also uh, in, ensure they have uh, a presence uh, in, develop, in the developing world, um, they, they also need to get involved. Uh, this, the, it, whether it's the United States, um, countries here in Europe or Japan. Um, and ultimately, I think the dream of, of the East African diplomat that I met in Beijing will be realized not only by engaging China, um, but also uh, engaging the US, Europe, India, and others, and developing African models for development rather than importing those from the US or China. Um, so the next big relationship I look at in the book uh, is Europe, is here where I am today in Denmark. Um, this picture uh, shows um, Sarah Berthau, uh, a Danish woman who uh, in June 2012 uh, joined Tibetan protesters um, to demonstrate uh, against the visit of uh, then pre Chinese President Hu Jintao uh, here in Copenhagen, not too far where I'm sitting tonight. Now, the Europe-China relationship has grown uh, quite dramatically over the past two decades. There's been a strong trade and investment growth, and these have raised questions over China's political influence in Europe. Uh, and as you can see from, the, from this picture, uh, a policeman uh, here physically stops um, Sarah from displaying the Tibetan flag as uh, who's in, where, who, whose uh, motorcade was supposed to pass the Danish parliament. Now, th thanks to dutiful journalism and parliamentary oversight, uh, Denmark's democracy did react to this event. Um, a court ruling later found that these actions were unconstitutional and uh, against not only Sarah, but also a hundred uh, demonstrators that day who were either blocked from, uh, from protesting or detained by Copenhagen police throughout the city during President Hu's visit. And as Sarah told me, this left her believing that economic interests trump everything else for Denmark's leaders in, rela in relations with China. Uh, and that this prioritization of, of economic interests over political values, um, you know, has been around for quite some time in Europe in its relations with, with China, this concern 
that economic interests come first. And we see this in, in the recent uh, provisional investment deal uh, that the European Commission is advancing with China at the moment and debates about whether uh, it's worthwhile to go ahead with that uh, in, in face of, of, of forced labor conditions that have been reported in China's Xinjiang region. But this, this question, the values versus interests debate, uh, it deserves attention in Europe, but similar to the debt trap versus just business debate, I find it's only one of the pressing question that's, questions that define Europe and China's relations. The economic side of the equation uh, also deserves scrutiny. And in the book, I explore how Europe is recognizing that China is not only an economic partner, uh, but also uh, a, an economic competitor. Uh, and to compete, compete more robustly with China, uh, Europe has started to sort of unpack what it means, um, uh, what China's rise means for its, its, its welfare and its, and its interests. And, and, and this is not simply a story of, of values versus interests, but also uh, a story of China challenging some of Europe's economic interests as well. So how did this come about? Um, I think the, the EU recognized China as an economic competitor uh, through two, two changes in its relations and one consistency. Now, the first change was that uh, over the last decade, there's been an influx of, of Chinese foreign investment in, into Europe. So between 2000 and 2017, Chinese investment actually surpassed uh, in, into the EU, actually surpassed EU investment going to China in that period. Um, and unlike uh, others, such as the US, a lot of Chinese investments um, were or have been acquisitions. So the takeovers of, of European companies um, and not what, what one calls greenfield investments, uh, which are usually tied to creating you know, new production facilities, factories, or, or services that, that tend to generate more jobs and growth. Actually, only 5% of Chinese investment in the EU uh, from 2000 to 2019 has been classified as, as greenfield uh, investments. So there was this influx of, of Chinese investment um, that had not uh, really taken place uh, before into the EU. Secondly, the second change was that uh, this growth of Chinese acquisitions came around the same time that Beijing launched uh, a new industrial policy called Made in China 2025. Uh, that, was, that was launched in 2015. And it was designed to support Chinese companies to overtake uh, you know, their competitors in advanced manufacturing, both at home and abroad uh, by offering new state backing and support. Uh, and this really presented a direct threat to, to the well-being of, of Euro European manufacturers, as well as American and East Asian uh, manufacturers. And along with the acquisition of, of EU, EU companies, uh, this really, really set off alarm bells uh, in, in a lot of uh, European capitals. Um, and the third point, the consistency, was that uh, on top of these two big changes that Europe was experiencing in its relations with China. Uh, China maintained uh, qu quite high investment restrictions at home. Uh, these, these are four times higher than the OECD average. And this lack of, of reciprocity pushed change in EU policy. By 2019, China designated, sorry, the EU designated China as an important economic partner, um, but also a strategic competitor and systemic rival. And these new um, uh, uh, you know, viewpoints towards China and Europe, they went beyond just words and, and, and on, in policy papers. Um, with China on its mind, the EU has launched uh, an investment screening mechanism uh, to ensure um, that uh, foreign companies, companies from outside the EU um, cannot, or, or at least there's transparency about whether they are gaining uh, state-backed subsidies from China or other countries uh, when they purchase European companies. Um, there's, uh, you know, new anti-subsidy rules are in development within uh, the European Commission. 
Uh, perhaps mo most strikingly, Germany and other European countries have raised their own national barriers on uh, foreign acquisitions and have actually blocked several Chinese investments in recent years. Um, this potential investment deal between the EU and China uh, can ease some of uh, these uh, tensions between both sides, but implementation and enforcement of the deal uh, remains questionable, uh, considering China, China's uh, past where it has opened some sectors in the past, but then later closed them or, or closed some formal restrictions, but then opened some new informal restrictions. So the questions over implementation are critical um, if that investment deal is going to ease some of these economic tensions. Now, there's also uh, the one of the things that I think you know has has kept the EU from being more offensive in their pro approach to China. Many of these new policies are defensive in nature. Has been uh, what I see as a myth of of Europe's economic dependency on China. And I've I've sort of put together two graphs where I try to uh, show uh, at least in its simplest form why Europe is not economically dependent on China. So here you see. Um, China and the and the U.S. as trading partners for for the EU 27 over the last uh, 10 11 years, uh, and you see pretty robust growth for both uh, China and the U.S. as as trading partners for for the for the EU. Um, because of the pandemic, we know that that already that China surpassed the United States uh, in terms of goods trade. Uh, with the EU. Of course, if you include services, the US is still the EU's number one trading partner. But this shows you the strong growth of, of China's trade uh, in the past decade. Now, if you take this uh, strong growth of both China and the US, and you see it as a whole of all of the EU-27's trade, you get a much different picture of, of the importance of China. And that's this, um, where the green line represents internal trade uh, within uh, between EU members and the bottom five lines represent uh, uh, trade with with the largest external partners. So China, you know, and the U.S. get lost uh, in this in this mesh of of external partners, uh, and internal trade uh, remains dominant. So basically, you know, in in, in 2019, for example, China made up only five percent. Of, of EU um, trade uh, in goods, uh, the US was 5.5, and internal trade was, was 59%. So there's not this sort of strong trade uh, dependency. Um, even for uh, a country like Germany, which makes up the you know, sort of the lion's share of trade between the EU and China, there isn't <clears throat> a a dependent trade relationship with China. Actually, Germany has a diverse set of external partners. Um, China is Germany's number one trading partner. Uh, it represents over 8% of its trade, but the US and the Netherlands are right behind it, uh, as is France. This is even true when it comes to growth. So just new uh, euros um, in, in recent years. From 2015 to 2019, China represented 15% of, of that growth. But Italy and Poland generated more new growth uh, for, for Germany. And the EU as a whole generated over 60% of Germany's trade growth. So what makes uh, these, these ideas of, of, China, of the EU's dependency on China, uh, a lot? what keeps them alive, I think, is, is some of the high corporate dependencies that exist uh, between some EU companies and the Chinese marketplace. Uh, a 2017 study by Handelsblatt found that for, for uh, the top German companies, on average, 15% of their sales was in China. Uh, and this can even be higher than 15% for some, like Volkswagen, but also non-German companies like Airbus. Uh, their revenue dependencies on China can go above 20%. At the same time, um, however, you know we need to to understand that corporate interests um, are not always the same as national interests. Uh, and, and some European companies may be betting big on China, 
but their activities do not necessarily improve the welfare of their home economies. And, and this goes the same. Uh, this is the same for, for uh, you know, large American companies, uh, companies like Apple and, and Boeing and, and, um, and Nike, for example, have very high, uh, 20, 25% of their sales are generated from China, but this doesn't translate into, into strong national interests. Those connections, the new jobs and growth uh, aren't necessarily there. Um, you know, one European diplomat I interviewed told me that his job wasn't to question the theory of whether trade and investment with China improves welfare back home, but simply to promote trade and investment with China. Um, but I think Europe's experience in particular demonstrates that we need to question this theory uh, that foreign trade and investment naturally le leads to, to welfare improvements back in the home economies of large corporations. We've seen, you know, uh, for, in, for example, you know, Germany's trade with China uh, is estimated to only represent 2% of jobs uh, in Germany. Uh, we, we, we see that the EU's competitiveness, uh, its global manufacturing value has dropped quite significantly significantly in the past two decades. And, you know, European companies, even the large ones that are deeply integrated into China are also facing new competitive threats uh, from, from Chinese uh, firms. Uh, you know, you can think about Huawei, the Chinese telecom giant, and how it was able to uh, you know, outcompete uh, Ericsson, uh, Nokia in, in, in first in China, and then is now challenging them uh, around the world, uh, Ericsson and Nokia, the two um, large uh, Nordic telecom companies. And probably within the next 10, 20 years, we'll see similar challenges towards uh, some of Germany's large uh, automakers like Volkswagen, like Volkswagen, like Daimler, um, if the current balance uh, and uh, the current lack of market reciprocity isn't uh, uh, reformed. So there has been some you know, uh, recognition of, of sort of the, the, the lack of, of benefits that are coming from Europe's engagement uh, with China. The, the 17 plus one group, uh, which is a group between China and, and, and 12 members of the EU in Central and Eastern Europe and, and five other European states, uh, its, its importance has really been waning in recent years as some of these countries haven't experienced a lot of growth in trade and investment from China since joining this political group. They're not really interested in loans. They want to see their companies uh, and their markets succeed from engaging China, and they're not seeing this. Uh, and we, see, we still see, despite you know, the provisional investment deal that the EU is pursuing with China at the moment, we still know that Germany and other member states are calling for WT, WTO reform to, to, to push to level the playing field of China. So on top of this important debate that takes place uh, in the EU about interests versus values, there is a growing focus on long-term competitiveness with China. Uh, and th this, I think, will be central moving forward and, and dictating the direction of Europe's relations with China and is a, is a critical sort of uh, point in, in, in upsetting uh, a lot of the, the sort of more amiable ties that have existed between Europe and China of late. So the last um, relationship I want to look at is China's sort of broader relations with its, its neighbors in Asia. Um, you know, how are China's neighbors adapting to its dramatic rise? Um, is the EU, or sorry, is America behind uh, the development of an Asian NATO uh, among China's larger neighbors to contain China? This is really the, the question and the accusation that is often thrown at uh, the US by Chinese officials, such as Foreign Minister Wang Yi, that the US uh, in developing uh, the quadrilateral security dialogue, the quad between the United States, Japan, India, and Australia is really trying to contain China's rise. Um, but I think the story of the quad uh, can also Know, be seen uh, in a different light. Um, its, its actual origin uh, and its, its development over time was 
you know, really exemplified um, by the story of, of, of Shinzo Abe, uh, the, the, who is, is the longest serving prime minister in Japanese history. He recently stepped down, of course. Um, but his story really exemplifies um, how a lot, many of China's larger neighbors feel towards its, its assertive rise. Um, the economic rise of China, coupled with, with tensions with Japan over East China Sea island disputes, uh, promoted Abe to reach across Asia for new sources of economic growth and new partnerships to deter uh, China's military assert assertiveness. And this didn't take place just in the last decade. This already started back in 2007 when Abe visited uh, New Delhi seeking a closer economic, political, and defense uh, relationship with India. And speaking to the Indian parliament, Abe called on uh, the countries to, to ignite a dynamic coupling of the Pacific and the Indian oceans as seas of freedom and prosperity. And the second and third largest economies in Asia, uh, they do share democratic values and, and there are economic prospects in the relationship, but it, is it was really the geopolitical concerns, the shared geopolitical concerns and security fears that uh, they felt from China that brought these two countries together and forming a stronger defense cooperation. Uh, and this result points to, to Asian countries um, leading this pushback on China within Asia, that this wasn't sort of an American plot uh, necessarily against China, but China's neighbors were also quite active in, in, this, in the development of the Quad and, and other partnerships. If anything, at the time, it was fear of American disengagement from Asia under President Bush and, and later Obama that pushed Japan in this direction to look for new partners. So J Japan is, is far from the, the only country uh, developing a critical view of China in Asia. Uh, you know, we often hear about these tremendously high negative perceptions that China has developed in the West, in North America and, and Europe of late. But there's also been a, a downward trend in attitudes in, among some countries in the Asia Pacific. Uh, over the past two decades, Pew Research show surveys show that once majority positive views towards China, including in Japan, but also Australia, South Korea, uh, Indonesia, and, and elsewhere, that they, they've fallen by double digits. Um, and they no longer you know, have positive majorities. People don't view China uh, in positive majorities anymore. And, and you know, some of the, these countries are China's neighbors. Uh, some of these countries know it best. They've long welcomed China's uh, growing prosperity. They've, they've taken part in it. Uh, they've benefited from it. They have strong trade dependencies that uh, you know, are several times higher than any dependencies that Europe, Europe has on China. But they've nonetheless grown suspicious of Chinese investments and, and, and its military might, demonstrating sort of a broader concern uh, with China's behavior that extends outside of, 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 of Japan. And these sentiments, um, uh, you know, these sentiments have led to actual tangible outcomes. These aren't just sort of uh, frivolous opinions. Um, they've led to a rise of collective responses uh, against China. And on, on the economic front, um, you know, after uh, President uh, Trump abandoned the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, Tokyo, uh, Japan kept the, the deal alive, uh, as many of you are aware, he, and, and brought the remaining 11 members together and saw the trade pact signed by 2018. Japan and India have also you know, agreed to an annual two plus two defense and foreign ministerial dialogues. They have also, you know, agreed to share one another's military defense, uh, military bases overseas. Um, India and Australia have also uh, improved their um, relations. Uh, so you see, you know, Asian countries also coming together. Uh, India's own motivation are really, uh, you know, dramatically changed after the 2020 uh, border fighting with China, this really galvanized views, um, uh, uh, critical views towards China and India. Uh, it also led to India blocking you know, uh, Chinese um, tech companies um, and, and apps like TikTok. Um, we will probably see 
you know, India uh, not engage so deeply uh, or, or, you know, really cut its engagement quite strongly um, with, with Huawei, the Chinese telecom company in, in the coming years. And, and really, you know, really China has upset uh, it, its relations uh, with India just in the last two years. Uh, and if you think about China wanting to become a global leader in technology, how does one do this without, you know, India's 1.3 billion population on board? Even in Southeast Asia, I often think we, we, we get the view wrong. Uh, this is often seen as China's backyard. China is, of course, the largest trader there. It has you know, uh, cultural and, and, and physical connections with the region. Um, but the US remains the largest investor there. Japan is the largest provider of finance there for infrastructure. And you know, well over half of expert respondents uh, in, in one survey from, from ASEAN, from the Southeast Asian countries, said that they would like their countries to, their countries to participate in, in the Quad. So we see really this diversity of power uh, uh, coming through in Asia as well. So let me quickly conclude. Um, I hope you know, I can provide some snapshots from the book that demonstrate um, that China's rise in the world will not be solely determined by its rivalry with the United States, that the rest of the, the world matters in China's future, uh, in China's global influence. Uh, you know, the US and, and China represent 40%, uh, even more uh, of the global economy, but the other 60% um, of the global economy, the other militaries, the other tech giants uh, are also important uh, to future issues from, from getting over the COVID-19 pandemic to, to addressing climate change and the direction of, of free trade. Neither, I think, should we assume that China's uh, rise to the, you know, will rise to the commanding heights of global affairs and the global economy. Uh, this is not inevitable. I often hear this word used by social scientists when speaking about China, inevitable. Uh, and that, you know, that always sets me off because that's, I think, a word we should avoid using in social science. Um, Chinese leadership, you know, decides how they project their country's newfound power. Uh, and how the rest of the world chooses to respond will have a deep uh, impact in shaping China's future influence. And the decline of the United States uh, does not necessarily automatically lead to a world with China in charge. Other major powers will, will dictate our future. But I think you know, other countries uh, have this responsibility uh, as well to ensure that tensions don't flare up uh, to, to, to high degrees towards conflict with China. Uh, and, and, and this will entail cooperating with China on issues such as climate change, uh, on uh, negotiating uh, new uh, technology standards in the world, uh, but also uh, balancing and, and deterring uh, some of China's more assertive ambitions, uh, its, its military uh, actions uh, in Asia, um, uh, its interference in the domestic affairs of other countries. So I, you know, just to conclude, I think you know, we need foreign leaders in Delhi and, and Tokyo and Berlin to, to work together to help steer some of the more uh, inflammatory uh, tensions between the United States and China towards compromise and cooperation. Thanks. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Petty. That was that was great. You really distilled all of the rich detail uh, from your book so so wonderfully. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. I see a few questions already. Um, please, uh, if you have a question, uh, please uh, put it in the Q and A function. And uh, before we get there, I just have a, a couple of of um, questions that I'm going to pose. And one is about this really fascinating portrait you paint of the EU-China relationship. Uh, and we don't often get such a, such a, uh, a detailed and varied appreciation of it as, as you presented. And one thing that has puzzled Americans is why the EU signed the investment agreement at the end of December, just before the new 
U.S. administration uh, came in uh, when uh, there was hope there would be greater coordination between the U.S. and uh, the EU. So can you explain how this investment agreement fits into the, the picture you you developed of a rising sense of discomfort uh, with the relationship and the sense of China as a competitor. What does the EU hope to achieve with this agreement? It's an excellent question. Um, and, you know, the agreement, it, it was first, you know, initiated back, at, I think, in 2012, uh, 13. You know, it, it's been sort of seven years of negotiation. Um, and it's you know the, its proponents um, hope that China will will follow through uh, with with what it's offering in the agreement that it will be implemented and enforced that forced technology transfers um, will be will will, will go away uh, and that there will be new these offers of market access um, will be will be committed to by the Chinese um, at the same time. Um, we, we hear, you know, more critical views of, of, of the deal, um, concerns that it won't be enforced, concerns that it won't be implemented. Um, the market access uh, that has been offered by China to the EU, you know, you know, really repackages some of the previous commitments that China's already made through the, through, you know, its own, uh, its own commitments that China's made to reform its economy. So there's, there's also questions that this deal doesn't necessarily do uh, all too much new. Um, so I think it, it represents a dated, my opinion, it, it represents a dated view of, of, of China um, in, in the EU. It, it represents you know, the view that, that European leaders had back in 2013 and 2012 and 13 that I think you know, is, is we, we see a, a different China emerging over, the, over that, this past decade. Um, so you know, I think it, it was pushed forward because uh, there was this sense that there's nothing to lose. Um, there was a sense, I think, that EU leaders still I I expect to push uh, with, with the Americans, Japanese, and others on, uh, you know, crucial WTO reform. Um, there was also the, you know, uh, Angela Merkel, the, the German chancellor, wanted a, a, a sort of a, a, a success from Germany's uh, presidency, uh, six-month pre presidency of the EU late last year. This was really something uh, that she personally and, and, and Germany wanted to push, push through. Um, but I don't think that sort of discounts uh, necessarily away from, from working with the United States and others uh, on, on WTO reform and sort of deeper, deeper, um, uh, deeper commitments, pulling, getting deeper commitments out of China on, on how it manages its economy and trying to find better Better ways to cooperate with the Chinese. Um, so I, I think you know it. Ultimately, it's it. It, it was sort of a nothing to lose. Uh, the, the the sense what there was there there was nothing to lose, and that cooperation with the U.S. could still move forward, and that this would offer some some new uh, access to 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 German companies in the automobile industry in particular. Uh, one of our questioners in the audience, uh, Charlie Wong. Um, also asked about this, and he uh, said he was interested in how this agreement fits into your portrayal of the values interest divide. Does mm. this say something about uh, which way uh, the EU is going in terms of its um, its strategy with towards China? My my impression is that you know EU, EU leaders are still you know content uh, are still sort of um, keen on having it all. You know, uh, keen on being able to to say that they're standing up for for European democratic values, but also advancing their their economic interests uh, uh, with with China. Um, and I think you know that's where in the book I try to outline that this this is probably a mistake because we have to understand that economic interests um, you know can be divided between short term interests and more long term strategic interests, uh, and that if the Europe continues on this path um, where it, it's operating on you know, an uneven playing field with its Chinese competition, which even if the deal you know, is, is ratified and implemented and enforced, there won't be an even playing field between the two. Um, that that it, 
EU leaders need to, you know, better understand that they're that this is a, you know, the strategic competition between the Chinese and their long-term welfare uh, will com continue to be undermined if they don't push stronger on on the uh, competitive side. But yes, I think you know the political values, despite uh, strong words at, at times from EU leaders, uh, are often ultimately undervalued uh, uh, in in new policies and agreements such as this one. Uh, but that being said, you know, the EU, I think just today or yesterday, you know, put sanctions on, on some Chinese officials uh, in connection with the you know, detainment of, of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. So we do see some development on the political value side as well. Uh, to follow up on that point, we have a question from uh, Sasha Chabra about Germany in particular, given uh, Germany's political history with Nazism. Um, the questioner asked, why wasn't there more pushback on the value side on the Uyghur issue um, in Germany? You know, I, I think Germany's position on China has long been steered forward by its, its trade interests, uh, despite its own, its own history um, with, with, with the targeting of, of ethnicities. Uh, Germany's car companies in particular have, have steered forward its foreign policy towards China. Um, we have to remember, you know, European and, 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 you know, even other Western countries, their foreign policies, I think, have, have long been anchored in just advancing trade and investment. Um, the idea that, you know, after the Cold War, there weren't these, these for, at least for, you know, maybe not for the Americans, but for, for Western European countries, there weren't these critical political issues that were prioritized. It was all about expanding trade and investment. And China's rise and, and China's strength and competitiveness has, I think, you know, shocked uh, some, some business, uh, you know, associations in Germany and elsewhere in Europe. And, and they're sort of recalibrating uh, their approach to China accordingly. Um, but you still have companies that are betting big on China. And these companies have the ear of European leaders, of the German chancellor, and that's, I think, where the critical link is that, that ultimately leads to political values being, being undervalued in foreign policy. Okay, I wanted to ask another uh, current uh, issue question, and that is about the vaccine diplomacy. So uh, as you were writing this book, um, the, the vaccines were just rolling out. So, so that's not really um, a big part of your book. But I'm wondering how how do you see China's vaccine diplomacy playing out? Is it going to increase China's leverage, um, or is or is this a sign of missteps and overreach? We have just in the Times today an article about Brazil and how China is making inroads with vaccines in Brazil, and Brazil is an important trade partner for China, the number one source of its food imports. So uh, we're what, where do you see this issue of leverage versus pushback with vaccines? I think the provision of, of you know, China's sort of head start in, in providing and, and selling vaccinations to across, you know, much of, of, of the developing world in particular um, does, you know, help its, its influence. Uh, but I don't know how long lasting that will be for, for two reasons. One is that um, I think within the coming months and, and definitely in the next year or two, uh, the U.S. Will, will ramp up its engagement uh, in, in vaccination uh, provision abroad uh, and, and to, to, to not necessarily to you know, counterbalance China, although that's often stated in Washington, uh, but also to play that sort of larger uh, multilateral role that, that the U.S. Uh, is well known to do so. Um, and that will sort of, I think, you know, uh, balance some of this, this short-term influence that China's gained. Secondly, I mean, vaccinations don't necessarily make all of China's problems and, and challenges with other countries go away. Um, even countries uh, such as Brazil, which are, are facing quite a, a difficult epidemic with, with COVID at the moment, um, you know, China they still you know, are aware that Chinese companies, I mean, one of the issues I bring up in the book is that you know, countries in Latin America like Brazil and Argentina, but also in East Africa, like Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, 
China's China's challenging their own trade with one another regionally um, because Chinese imports are, for instance, undermining uh, Argentinian exports to Brazil and 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 vice versa. So um, vaccinations won't make some of these, I think, economic and, and political disputes necessarily uh, go away. On the subject of, of Kenya, we had a question by uh, John Mensing about uh, another uh, perhaps unintended consequence of uh, China's uh, economic involvement in other countries, and that's the um, the result of a mixed race offspring um, in many countries. And uh, how is this population going to to uh, shape relations between China and Kenya and other countries? Do you think? Well, I, I mean. Chinese labor uh, and 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 Chinese people are, are um, all around the world. They're, they've expand. They've they have a larger presence in Africa, um, historical presence, um, uh, and also have a, a have a new um, you know a, a new a newer presence from from a lot of these economic activities that they come along, uh, you know, uh, with with larger projects, but also they they are investors seeking uh, opportunities from some of the bigger large uh, infrastructure projects that China makes in Africa and elsewhere. Um, and this, I think, you know, has the, the potential to, to, to improve ties with China and, and local societies. Um, but we also, you know, in Kenya, uh, we also have sort of more uh, critical views of, of how, you know, Chinese companies and Chinese managers treat some of their local employees. Uh, we saw that with some of the projects uh, in, in Kenya um, and, and elsewhere on the African continent. Um, you know, we need to, I think, dismiss these, these a myth that China is sort of bringing all of its labor abroad when it makes these projects. Uh, studies have shown that it, it typically employs more locals. Um, but what's critical, I think, in, in the, its relationships in Africa, but also in, in different parts of the developing world is, is how Chinese projects actually create uh, new opportunities for productivity, local productivity, uh, that they help uh, ensure uh, that domestic companies are developing. Uh, and I think that if that takes place, China will sort of uh, iron out some of its more, you know, some of the more critical views it faces in Africa and elsewhere. Um, but to date, uh, that's not taking place, uh, that we don't see a lot of domestic companies uh, benefiting uh, strongly uh, from from the Belt and Road. Uh, did you consider the, the the Chinese inroads into the Caribbean in your uh, in your grand tour of of the Belt and Road and various continents? It wasn't. No, it wasn't a subject uh, I, I covered in, in in any detail. I think in, in the book. No. We had a question about that. I want to go to a big picture question that was asked about uh, the comparison between uh, uh, Japan's experience in the, in the 1970s and 80s. This is from Robert Hoppins. Um, he, he was saying that one of your first slides struck him as being similar to critiques of Japanese ODA and FDI in the 1970s and 80s. Um, he's asking, are Chinese strategic thinkers or BRI planners aware of this comparison, especially since China was a big recipient of Japanese ODA? Yes, I, I mean, you know, scholars who've studied this, uh, such as you know Deborah Brautingham at, at John Hopkins and others, have have shown how you know the the Chinese you know development finance, in a way you know mirrors that of of uh, of the Japanese before it. Um, that this is more sort of an East Asian uh, mode of, of development. Um, so yes, I, I you know I, I think though you know the Chinese uh, are are unlike the Japanese um, are operating I think on a different scale, uh, um, and and they I think another thing that defines the Chinese engagement is its variety. Uh, you know China is uh, still a, a large you know. Of course, a large economy, but also still a diverse one, um, with you know very rich uh, and 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 still uh, you know uh, 
still sort of impoverished regions. And that means that, uh, you know, it's developing everything from uh, from sort of medium and even some high value goods to still low cost manufacturing um, uh, clothing and, 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 and apparels that that uh, that other developing countries hope they can capture from China. And it's this, I think, regional diversity uh, that, that makes China you know, stand out, that, that, that makes its uh, engagement with, with the developing world uh, quite different, uh, I think, than, than Jap Japan's turned out to be. Uh, and, and it produces challenges too, because as I you know, detail in the book, um, developing countries aren't seeing sort of new manufacturing investment uh, coming strongly as they had hoped from China, but instead China, you know, it, it's an important partner to these countries, but it's still a competitor um, to the, these countries as well, uh, in that it's producing a lot of these low income products uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, unlike Japan, would you say that China is also involved in more resource extraction rather than for Japan, a lot of this was a product cycle situation where as Japan advanced uh, uh, other out-of-date technologies or labor-intensive technologies would move to other countries. Is this different in terms of China's approach? Um, you know, I, I, I've heard in the book, you know, I, I met with different sort of uh, local economic leaders and, and they often felt that they were getting, you know, secondary technology from China. Um, so that's, that's definitely there. Um, you know, as you know, Chinese oil companies, uh, uh, unlike the Japanese, Chinese oil companies are, are much more active abroad. Um, and they're not only investing in, in, in oil, uh, but also Chinese mining companies investing in, in, in minerals and rare earths, um, much more active than I, you know, to my knowledge than the Japanese, um, did, uh, in, in their time. Okay, so let's turn to uh, to China and and its awareness of these of this pushback. So we had a question, a good question um, from Minye about about this. Um, Minye asks, uh, does the is the Chinese government aware of 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 these of these this pushback in your view, and how will Chinese leaders respond? It's a good question. I think we're, 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 you know, firstly, I think, you know, the, the Trump presidency, um, for me at least, demonstrated, you know, uh, that China, well, it, for me, it was sort of a, a, a failure of, of Chinese foreign policy to, 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 uh, to expand its, its global influence. So instead of, of capitalizing uh, on, on Trump, uh, on President Trump sort of upsetting a lot of America's relations with, with key allies, uh, China seemed to pick a fight uh, at the same time um, with, with Europe, with, with Japan, uh, with Australia, with Canada, um, and not sort of gain uh, new, new positive ties of these countries. Um, uh, so you can, you can for, instance, for example, look at the Meng Wanzhou case, this Huawei executive that uh, the Canadian authorities uh, detained in, in you know I think the late December uh, 2018 if I'm not mistaken uh, and the response this this was done on an American extradition uh, extradition uh, a warrant um, that Canada responded to and the response from the Chinese uh, was to detain uh, two Canadian citizens uh, in China uh, uh, and to put trade restrictions on some Canadian exports uh, and um, Meng is still under house arrest in Vancouver, and, and the two Canadians, uh, are, uh, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, are in prison in China, and 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 you know charged with with uh, espionage uh, charges, abstract espionage charges. So one needs to think what what did what would have been the outcome if China decided in that case and other cases to take a different direction, to to protest Canada's. Uh, uh, are the, Amer the Americans putting a, an arrest warrant on Hmong, um, but not to actually, you know, hit back against the Canadians, but simply to protest the Americans' action strongly. Um, 
we, I, I'm sure we would see, you know, Canada's relations with China being much stronger uh, than they are today. We would probably see Huawei uh, being much more active in Canada than it than it will be in the years ahead. Um, so I think I'm 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 still sort of on the fence on whether or not China's top leadership uh, is is determined to simply go it alone uh, and 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 really sort of strike back at anyone who causes the slightest offense or treads closely to their political red lines, or whether um, there will develop sort of a, 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 a you know a, a thicker skinned foreign uh, policy that uh, that sort of doesn't take um, you know smaller uh, political issues uh, and and blow them out of out of proportion. Um, maybe the EU investment deal uh, is one demonstration of China trying to to manage its and improve its ties of with the EU uh, as. Uh, President Biden came into the White House. Uh, we see some disengagement uh, on the dis disputed border and the Himalayan border between India and China. Recently, some disengagement, some agreement to to ease tensions. Um, if these actions hold, um, then I think that might demonstrate that China is showing some responsiveness to to uh, its its sort of broader relations being upset, not only with the U.S. but also with with the EU. Uh, and in India. So we need to watch this space of whether China act, is actively working to improve its ties um, uh, or it still you know, remains very strongly reactionary to, to countries that, it, that, uh, that, that sort of cross its, its expanding political red lines. Um, on a similar topic, we had a question about, about China's soft power and uh, the questioner asked, why doesn't Chinese culture have the same power at, and influence in the West as at, at the Japanese and South Korean culture, for example? Uh, I can say that I can see that at my own university, where students much prefer to study Japanese and Korean rather than Chinese. Soft power was not a subject, and and, and cultural influence was not something I looked at uh, too deeply in the book, so I, I hesitate to to respond to that uh, uh, without doing much research on it. Okay. Um, well, let's think about the, 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 the big picture then. Um, uh, we had a question about what concerns you most about Xi Jinping and China in the decade to come? Um, I think, you know, it, this, this attitude, uh, that 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 President Xi and and, and China's economic uh, sort of China's political leadership um, sort of believe the hype, uh, believe that um, China uh, is you know on its path to become a dominant superpower. In that it it will sort of have you know uh, influence at getting countries to do what they otherwise wouldn't do around the world. Uh, in not only. In Africa or Latin America, but also in Europe and uh, and 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 across Asia, um, because I don't think that is is the the future that China is headed headed to. And if if they sort of um, overweigh uh, their their power and influence, that can that can you know lead to to new tensions with countries, um, be it India or Japan, um, be it uh, towards uh, the Taiwan issue. Uh, and and whether um, China uh, pushes for a military invasion you know, within the next decade, um, this is not to say again that China is not a significant power, um, but that uh, you know if countries, uh, uh, particularly in Asia, uh, continue to 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 develop you know uh, a collective responses, um, then. China's sort of influence and, and power will be limited. It's it. This is not, I think, you know, the China is not the U.S. emerging from from uh, World War II. Um, the you know the post-pandemic world. China certainly uh, uh, has you know its economy is still growing robustly compared to um, most other industrialized nations. Um, but this isn't uh, you know so lopsided that China will will uh, be able to sort of be in charge of, of Global affairs and, and the global economy, and, and this sort of uh, the belief that it, it might have that type of power could lead to to, to conflict uh, and to to high levels of tensions. 
I had a question though about the consequences of pushback given mm. China's sensitivity, its uh, mm. century of humiliation and so on. Um, interestingly, when China, when China was weaker, I think world powers have been more cautious about China's red lines, but now that China's stronger, we see more determination uh, to view China as a competitor as you have demonstrated um, in the European case in, in Asia. So do you think that this kind of pushback uh, that uh, you're advocating would lead China to reinforce its nationalistic responses and to be more assertive in its responses? I think, you know, we need to also, and, and this is something I detail in the book, is, is we need to understand, you know, to sort of separate the um, sort of the, the strong words and responses that China often makes uh, towards other countries that upset its, its political sensitivities, you know, such as Australia's call for uh, an independent uh, study of the outbreak of, of, of COVID-19, uh, and, and, and to, you know, to see what China actually does in response. And of course, um, the Chinese applied uh, new trade restrictions on the, Australian, on the Australian economy, on Australian goods, but if you sort of unpack uh, how stringent those are, um, they only really impact around 4% of, of Australian uh, exports to China. That, that's a significant amount, of course, barley farmers and winemakers and, and other industries targeted uh, are damaged by, by these restrictions. They need to uh, adapt uh, and, and find uh, new markets to sell their goods, and, and, and some of them have. But at the same time, uh, it demonstrates that I think China is still sensitive about its economic growth, um, that it still doesn't sort of do what the United States, for instance, has done with other countries and, and put comprehensive sanctions uh, on, on, on those countries that uh, it sees as working against its interests. Uh, Canada is another example. Um, of course, you know, China has detained the two Canadians, um, but the trade restrictions that, that China put on Canada over the last years really didn't put a huge dent in, in, China, in Canada's uh, trade with China. You know, it only dropped by around 3 billion Canadian dollars from 18 to 19. Uh, and you know, that's exports drop, sorry, trade dropped by, by 3, 3 billion. Um, but Canada's sort of uh, trade, you know, is, 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 is exports alone are I think 447 billion. So you know, China is, it, it, it wants this, the, these acts to have a demonstrational effect to get other countries to think twice before they they question some of uh, China's political interests. But at the same time, that demonstrates that China still has these its own economic sensitivities when it tries to coerce others. It doesn't want to upset its own uh, growth. Uh, you know, in the Canadian case, um, uh, Canadian canola um, uh, was blocked by the Chinese, but suddenly the United Arab Emirates uh, was selling a lot of canola oil to China. Um, uh, as the Canadians shipped it in there. Uh, the same took place with Norway, uh, where China blocked uh, its salmon exports uh, back in um, 2010 um, uh, because of, its, of the Nor Nobel Peace uh, Committee's uh, awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to the Bao uh, in 2009, uh, a human rights activist um, and, and democracy activist in China. But that salmon that was blocked, uh, firstly, you know, was quite minuscule if you think of uh, the Norwegian economy. Uh, it just represented sort of a, a little over a billion dollars over the, the years it was blocked. And a lot of salmon found its way through Vietnam uh, into China. So you, you see in all these cases um, that China is quite hesitant in, in sort of pu putting the hammer really down on countries. Will that change? Um, over time, uh, as China becomes more economically confident, I don't know. Uh, we will that change uh, if China is successful in, in in some of its self sufficiency drives. Um, that that's not clear. But I I think you know China can do uh, can particularly with countries like Australia where there's strong dependencies, it can do significant damage um, to to the Australian trade. But it, it elected not to, uh, and I think you know that this is opens the door, I think, to, to the idea that there's still room to cooperate, uh, that China still realizes that 
it needs the world uh, to a certain degree, uh, and and that 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 might you know um, present the the possibility uh, for negotiation for for sort of uh, uh, rewriting some of the WTO trade rules to to account for for some of these course of acts from China and from others. It's interesting that when you uh, look at the actual sanctions China imposes, they're so limited because China's wolf warrior diplomats certainly speak very loudly about them. And, and so uh, how do we explain this? Is this a, a pandering to domestic nationalism? Or we had a questioner asked, is China actually its own worst enemy? Um, so, I think you know. Yes, it's it's demonstrating to domestic constituencies that that the the Communist Party is defending uh, China's interests overseas. Um, but at the same time, I think you know Chinese diplomats realize that you know uh, this is a great media story. Uh, these acts of economic coercion. Um, that uh, you know, even though it might just be. Um, uh, a few billion dollars that are targeted uh, out of hundreds of billions of dollars in trade. Uh, you know, media here in Europe and, and definitely in the US as well, in Australia, they pick it up and they dramatize it. Uh, they focus on, you know, those industries that are damaged by it. And that, you know, can have a, a lasting impact uh, on, on the behavior of others. Uh, um, at the same time, however, um, you know, uh, I think because this has been done so frequently uh, over the last four years, China, in this in this sense, you know, has shot itself in the foot, um, uh, or maybe in the process of doing so. As we see, uh, countries and and first of all, you know, researchers and scholars and 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 journalists and debates and policymakers debate about how to counter even these sort of uh, these you know economic acts of economic coercion. Um, there's been ideas that you know uh, a Japanese you know uh, scholar hasn't had an idea of there should be a slush fund that that countries can pay into and when their industries are targeted by China they can draw out of that slush fund to to help their companies or others have suggested that there be uh, a, a, a critical response uh, in in and placing trade restrictions on China when it does this to others and and you know recently um, the United States linked. Uh, you know, it's it, its own re relationship with China and improving that relationship with China, alleviating some of the uh, tensions that it has with Australia. So we, you know, these acts uh, are pushing um, other countries to 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 work uh, closer together than they than they used to on these things. Um, you know, I, I had at one point in the research process, I had a European diplomat tell me that you know we we would never. Uh, you know, upset our industry in order to help protect protect another European industry that was targeted by China in some economic coercion. But just you know, a year or two later after that conversation, the EU is discussing anti-coercion mechanisms mechanisms that the regional body can use should one of its member states be targeted by China or or another foreign power. So th these things are developing. They're still you know at the talking stage, um, but they're they're entering sort of uh, the policy. Uh, world as well. Uh, turning to, to Asia, you conclude with a, a great discussion of the changing geopolitics in Asia in response to, to uh, China's rise. Um, we have a question about China's role in the geopolitics of energy in South Asia. Was that an issue that you covered in your book? Not to a great extent. Um, I, you know, China, I think, is is has is certainly interested in 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 using South Asia as sort of a land bridge, um, Pakistan uh, in particular, uh, to to bring uh, oil and, and other critical resources uh, to its western borders uh, and to avoid um, what Chinese leaders call uh, have 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 sort of seen as the the sort of the its Malacca uh, dilemma. This sort of narrow strait uh, south of, of Malaysia at Malacca, and, uh, where you know uh, Chinese military leaders think the U.S. could really put a choke point on the large amount of energy resources that travel through that strait heading to East Asia. 
Um, and so China has a, a already developed a pipeline, an oil pipeline through Myanmar. Uh, it's not particularly large, I think around 400,000 barrels a day. Uh, and they have aspirations to do so as part of their uh, the China-Pakistan economic corridor in Pakistan across sort of the, 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 the length of, of, of the country uh, into Xinjiang region. But this, you know, in many senses is a pipe dream um, because of its high cost, because of, you know, the, the risks that come uh, from, from developing that infrastructure in, in some of the instable regions in Pakistan. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, China is, is, is keen to, I think, where energy is concerned, to, to use the, to try to use the region to alleviate some of its, uh, some of this, this tension that's built up around the Malacca Strait. Um, but, uh, you know, as I sort of detail in the book, this is very difficult to do considering this, the, just the enormity of, of Chinese oil imports that need to come through uh, to the country. Um, and that most of this is, despite China's successes in diversifying some of its uh, oil suppliers, uh, you know, country, you know, it's increased its access or it's increased its supplies, land supplies from Russia, it's increased, you know, sea supplies from, from Angola. Um, still, you know, roughly half of its oil resources are still coming from the Middle East, the Persian Gulf. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's sort of just a hard reality. And I think, you know, this will become uh, a more pressing issue for China, but also India in the coming years um, to, to, um, because unlike the United States, uh, certainly not now after the U.S. shale oil boom, um, but even before, the U.S. was never sort of dependent on Middle Eastern oil. Uh, oil was always primarily coming from Canada and Mexico. Um, of course, the Americans had their corporate interests there uh, and, and geostrategic interests there because uh, developments in the Middle East will affect the oil price and that will affect the global economy. But the Chinese and, and the Indians also have this very strong dependency on, on getting oil outside, out from that region uh, to, to keep their economies going. And, and that's gonna you know, still be a pressing issue for the coming decades, despite uh, you know, the, the development of green technologies. Right. Um, on, the, on the Asia, uh, Asian region again, um, in the last chapter of your book, you really look at how the Quad emerged from, from the regional calculations of in Japan and India, as well as in the United States and Australia. But apart from the strategic pushback um, in the form of the Quad, do you see an, any economic pushback being formulated um, apart from the TPP, similar to, the, to what we're seeing now in the EU? I think, you know, the Biden administration is quickly realizing that some of its closer partners in terms of competing uh, with China are in Asia and not here in Europe. Um, that, you know, India and Japan in particular uh, and Australia seem to be more willing um, to, to at least now start to develop new policies and, and what seems to be expanding sort of the the agenda of the Quad uh, beyond uh, defense and security issues, which is often, you know, folk, which the focus is often put on. Um, so there's been, you know, discussions and, and new policies just in, I think, in recent weeks about developing a, a sort of a supply chains, independent supply chains, uh, for, for instance, in rare earths, sort of critical minerals that are used in the development of everything from uh, smartphones to uh, defense uh, equipment and, and, and weaponry um, that uh, uh, you had it, that, so China has this, this strong monopoly on the refining of rare earths. Of course, many countries have rare earths with, uh, in their borders, but refining it uh, can be, uh, first of all, a, a very messy process, environmentally damaging process, but China's also developed quite some some large scale in the refining of, of mineral earths. Um, and, but, you know, Australia uh, and Japan, um, uh, for instance, Australia, you know, has mineral earths. Um, Japan has helped uh, to, to, to encourage other countries to develop their mineral earths um, output. Um, and Malaysia has, has increased its production. Um, so it, it, I, 
you know, I see the quad again in, in these sort of strategic areas such as mineral earths, sorry, such as rare earths, that they might increase their activities there uh, in, in, in cooperation. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, 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 it's actually a ripe area, uh, mineral earths. And we, even in Japan alone, uh, you know, Japan, when it realized that it had this strong dependency on China, um, it was able to lower uh, its, its sort of its levels of dependency by, you know, around 20, 30% uh, in the last uh, 10, 20 years um, uh, by, uh, by companies, large Japanese conglomerates and, and large companies like Toyota uh, designing new production processes so that rare earths were, fewer rare earths were used in, in, in components, uh, in automobiles and other uh, vehicles, um, but secondly, developing and, and encouraging uh, new uh, venues of production and refinery, like in Malaysia and Australia, and, and finally having sort of a rare earths uh, uh, strategic uh, supply like one does uh, for, for oil. Um, so there, there are ways to counter this, this, this dominance that China has. And, and I think, you know, Chinese leaders are aware that if they push too hard on that issue, um, they will just encourage uh, these new uh, supply chains and new production venues, just as, you know, the Arab uh, oil crisis in, in the 70s encouraged new production uh, uh, activities in, in, in the North Sea, uh, but also in, in West Africa. Thank you. I, I think we've got, gotten through um, most of the questions from our audience. I'd like to thank the audience for staying with us uh, for, the, for the entire time. Um, is there anything that you would like to add, something that you wish you could have included in your book but uh, didn't, or any final thoughts? Well, you know, I think, you know, there are regions of the world uh, that, you know, China, what's, what's amazing about studying China today is China is everywhere. And, and, and there are regions in the world, you mentioned the Caribbean, but also, you know, the Middle East uh, and, and other regions that I would have liked to, to get to and unpack. Um, but uh, no, otherwise, I just want to say thanks. Uh, thanks for hosting this event. Thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts with us and thank you to the Weatherhead East Asian Institute for hosting this event.